and welcome to day seven of the Gratitude Concert. Today, uh, we will be going to hell. And, um, and I'm not going to do any recaps. You're welcome to go into the previous episodes, but uh, we're going to dive straight in to the story and start harvesting ideas. And so I received this story and I want to, to let this story be the foundation because it's a story that is, is going to be shared by a lot of people. So this is, um, this is another uh, um, person out of thousands and globally millions suffering from from the myalgic encephalomyelitis, and um, and it's just a small little piece of of text she sends me here. So she says, "I'm I'm turning 45 tomorrow. I would I would want I would love to invite my my grown up kids and my grandchild. I miss them and I miss my my boyfriend, but I I can't be with them uh, due to my ME." I'm constantly limited by my illness. I have to cancel everything and I'm and I'm shut inside my home. And then she writes, I'm a zombie, a living dead. And I've been that for 15 years and I find it, find it hard to carry on. And and she's not alone, of course. Uh, and I noticed in particular, I thought, zombie, a living dead. I was like, yes, now we can write some zombie music. And, uh, and, um, and no, it's of course much more serious than that. And we need to find a way to be universal about this thing. But I wanted to hold on to this feeling uh, of being a living dead, because that's, that's something you hear a lot, right? And people who are, who are sort of, unable to exit the confines of their homes, you know, it becomes, they feel like they're living dead. They're living, but they're not living. They're, they are dead, but they're still living. It's, it's, it's uh, by no means an, a new um, thing. She shares this horrible position with so many people, millions of people. And so um, We'd started going in and stealing a little bit from some myths, you know, some Greek myths on day five, I believe, with little Hermes running up the mountain to to um, to meet time on the top, and and um, and uh, things are coming together nicely. This is what happened. I was I was sitting there reading about this this little boy and his race uh, to meet time on the top of the mountain, and. I wanted uh, a mythical figure to, to replace his name, right? Because I couldn't use his real name because I, I never got the, the permission to use his real name. And so uh, I wrote my, my, my dear friend and collaborator, Martin Shans, and because he, he knows all the, the myth stuff, right? And I wrote him, what, what could be a great, you know, what, who do we have in the mythologies who are, who are the fastest? Who's the fastest of the gods, right? And then, of course... Um, he writes Hermes, of course, Mercury, Greek mythology, and and I just went with that. But he he also wrote to me another name, uh, this being Scandinavia and our sort of heritage being North Norse mythology, right? And and um, and and he found this this other um, uh, character called Hermod, right? Or Hermod or Hermod in Danish, which is he was one of Odin's sons. And he rode on Sleipner, Odin's horse, who he rode to, to hell to bring back his brother, Balder, right? Balder. And, and, um, and then I sort of, you know, then I, then I started just when I was, you know, engaging this story just now, I thought living dead, there is something there, you know, being raised on Norse mythology, um, we have all these stories from our childhoods, you know, in in this part of the world, and we are pretty intimate with the with with hell, 
and uh, that place in the mythology in the land of of, uh, of Nivelhel, where where um, where Hel, one of Loki's daughters, is reigning and and um, reigning supreme, and um, and there is a constant, you know, gods and and half gods are constantly entering this realm. It's a sort of a country that you can venture into. In the mythologies, they say it's northward and downward. It's 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 sort of almost like a location, unlike another, you know, other descriptions of hell being something that's completely inaccessible and only on the last day, you know, a certain someone goes down there and fights death and and whatnot, you know. But but in uh, in Norse mythology, there is a constant exchange. People go da- get down there and negotiate, you know, to bring back their loved ones and stuff like that. And so. Hermod is uh, Hermod is, is traveling down there on Odin's horse Sleipner to try and bring back Balder, and uh, and he can do that if if he can make. Uh, you know, Hel uh, tells him that that uh, that um, that she will release Balder if he can make every creature on on Earth and amongst gods um, cry for Balder. And so Hamel goes back and he manages to get everyone, every every creature, god, um, giant, human, to, to cry for Balder, except for one person, and that is, of course, Loki in disguise, who, uh, who isn't crying for him, is crying dry tears. And, and so that's not good enough for Hel, Hela, and she, she um, keeps Balder in Hel, uh, until after Ragnarok. So he'll not be released until after Ragnarok. And there are some elements to this story that I sort of, that I feel like we can combine and come and bring into the composition. You know, one is that uh, she uh, she's a living dead, you know, and that's the thing. You have people living in this world of Niflhel, right? And you they are there and you can actually get killed again in Niflhel and then come into a deeper layer of this realm but but Balder is there on the top layer of things right and and um, and so is this woman you know and so many others not living not dead uh, in this the, in this you know uh, this weird limbo right and so that's a connection and then there is also their loved ones you know wanting to 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 ride down to hell and bring them back to the world of the living. Um, I, for one, would love to jump on a horse and ride down and find my partner and drag her back to life, and I am not alone. And so there is something there. And uh, and there's also this idea of a reckoning, in a way, that, that you know, Balder will have to stay there you know, he can come out if everyone on the planet or everyone, gods or humans, would cry for him. And there is something as well in, in trying to bring awareness to the realm of chronic illness and trying to make everybody understand that this is real people living in the shadows. And 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 we should weep for them, cry for them. And maybe if everyone does that, it means that everyone would have understood what this is. And then, obviously, <laughs> we would have the financing for the research and all that sort of stuff. So there is definitely a connection, right, to being in hell. But it's only if people, you know, don't want you to be there that some someone is going to do something about it, you know. And so there is a connection too. And then, of course, Ragnarok, that he will not be let out until the after Ragnarok, the, the reckoning. And, and, and there is something there that I know that we're going to come back to, that... You know, there is there is another side to every illness because, of course, along the way they will all be cured. You know, and uh, or there will be a cure for each and every one of them. And and just to say it as it is with everything on this planet, you know, you choose which side you're on. You know, in your actions, right? So, doctors, researchers, people leading the medical industry, you know, they choose which side they want to be on 
you know, and uh, and how history will will remember them, right? And um, and maybe in this concert we should introduce a Ragnarok. Maybe we should introduce something that wipes out the wheel and a clean slate of sorts. But um, we're not yet there yet. We need to come down to hell. So let's write some death music today. We have a main theme, and let's try and begin there as we do so many times and try and see if we can create variations on that thing. <laughs> And so, death and Hela, uh, in this story, she's, just, you know, she's born of the trickster god, trickster god Loki, right? And, and and there is something slithery about the whole thing, right? You know, Hell is described as this cold and moist place, you know, and and the slithery movements for me on the piano of course are simply the close notes and, and um, so if we wanted to come down and do a variation on, on this thing it would be interesting to just do half notes from yesterday. If you remember, uh, day four, I believe we went into, uh, you know, and trying to describe this, this, uh, the system, right, being, you know, that weird part of society that exists in a lot of societies where you have this weird uh, constitutional authority that now has to go in and evaluate other people and decide who gets to, you know, get support and who doesn't get support and. And sort of play play guard with people, sort of these quasi or quack quack guard um, uh, systems, and just to yeah, you know, everyone involved in this thing is it's uh, you know a victim 
but but uh, um, but we came into this pattern, and we had those half notes again. Like, you can fill out this questionnaire. Come on, you could do that sort of thing, which is torture to an ME patient or many other different sorts of patients. And we also had that. just hold on to a little bit of the cliché in this case, because we're going to have so many themes and maybe it's not a bad idea that, that we try to sort of have something to really distinguish them by, like these half-note movements. And also, it's, 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 an incredible, it's an incredible feeling with, you know, these low strings moving around in these half-note situations, you know. It's, it's, it's truly entertaining for the body to to be a part of when they move around, you know, um, like vampires and snakes and dark clouds and mystery and, and wild creatures, you know, like grief standing there looking you in the eye and attaching rocks to the stomachs of people and Hella down there deciding who gets to get out of hell and who has to stay and... And these weird phenomena, you know, that is sort of outside of the human thing. And also, just to come back to the intervals, and I think this is a very important point, you know, that it's pretty simple. You know, it's not just because we heard, you know, the the half-note thing from at Bram Stoker's Dracula or something. Uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's also that if someone would talk to you in those intervals, then something would be off, right? So these are simply hu human utterances, at least what I go by when I write music, right? So, so someone who would, would say this to you. Right? You can imagine that. Or someone saying this to you. Right? But if someone were to say, you know, then there is like, there is like an inherent warning in those short steps. Then you introduce a little bit of a human by breaking, by breaking them and doing bigger, bigger leaps like here, right? That's human, but then something inhuman. A little bit human, and then human, very human, right? And then inhuman. judgment as well you know there is always you know that that um, that judgment hanging there right like uh, like we're sort of condemned and, you know you're a living dead then you know there is something something is keeping you in that limbo
There's something here also coming into that going down. You know, yesterday we, we were talking about the pendulum and, you know, these people lying in their beds are not really lying in their beds. You know, they're, they're being hurled through space-time, tied to a pendulum that carries the mass of their anger and their love and their passion and their loss, right? And they're hurled through space-time and, and we, we describe that here. Still in the five, the five beats relating to the ox and the wheel, you know. So, one, two, three, four, five. And so on. And, um, and, and this, that gives me this sort of, you know, if this was the beginning of falling, you know, or being dragged down to hell, you know. It could be this judgment right here, like in with the pendulum. But now let's try and get something more funeral-esque, you know, get something, you know, that's more of a caric caric caricature of death, you know, because we shouldn't be afraid of the caricature. We shouldn't be afraid I think of trying to describe things as they look in our, as they, um, as you know, how they look in our imaginations. Because odds are, you know, that would be true for your fellow man, right? And, and then you can share stories. You know, there's a reason why we have myths around in these things because we can share them, as opposed to a lot of abstract things. You know, they're all great and dandy and the frontier of things, but it's really hard to share them. You know, that's just a that's just a fact. You know. So we need, maybe we just need both, you know. And in, if you ask me in this world right now, there is too much of the abstract, too much of getting away from the center of things and the things that are relatable. And people are trying to distinguish themselves instead of finding common ground. And I think we should shift that balance a little bit. At least I'll make a try and attempt to balance the scale a little bit by engaging things I know people can, can see and relate to. At least I try to increase the chance, the odds. So we had that interval here, a judgment, a fourth. Right. And sort of allow the ox to escape, uh, not escape, but to regain his footing, you know, his, you know, the two birds he's working with are healed and flying in the sky and he gets up and, and they get back to work and that whole thing. So by the end of the ox's travels, and we don't know what's going to be in the concert yet, but we'll get to that. But we had that. Oh, I'm sorry.
So, um, we want to relate to some of that because this is about this person being a living dead and wanting to see her kids and her grandkids, right? And, and um, she wants to come out of hell and they want to bring her out of hell, right? So we need to find a way out. Here we have a funeral in a way or just the realm of the dead. sort of intermingle and now you know we're slowly starting at least what that's what I'm beginning to feel now that these stories how they are connected in the music you know after all it happens there are only 12 notes if we come up with enough themes they're going to be interlinking and everything and it's pretty exciting what what happens there and we in that sense we're building a creature you know that has its own agenda you know children theme, it might, the birth theme, and it should be the theme for the children. Because this comes again and again in the stories. You know, these are parents who are sick, a lot of them, and they just want to see their kids. And it's what keeps them alive, frankly, that their children are out there. So we should come in and see that. And for the captain, coming back to the lady with Meneer's disease, you know, she was in this rut, you know, and... And she would come up on the wave. And there was this looking out. But there was also her eyeing, you know, out in, in the, you know, the side of her eye, you know, she could see her children. And then 
we had the mother again, you know, little boy, little Hermes, as we call him, you know, with tuberous sclerosis and, uh, and the birth theme.
like an old song was. <laughs> intervals so it's a little bit of a recycling maybe that's all right we'll figure out if it holds water in the big picture when we get there sits there and and it's it tells me that it's pretty solid so far you know we're, we're wanting to try and see if the main theme can hold water and I, I really feel like everything we, we throw at it it sort of sucks up and it has to sort of be bigger than whatever we do and and not trying really hard it's it's it, it's still it, it does what it's supposed to it sort of triumphs you know so so it really it tells me it's pretty so far it's pretty solid I think you know.
So tons of ways to go to move forward with this thing. And I think <clears throat> this idea is as much sort of a, it's, a, it's, a it's, it's an idea that spreads out across the rest of the composition, I think. There is, there is more than there is just, okay, let's try and find some themes here and reference a little bit of Mozart. Then, you know, the, the, more than that, there is, there is something in, in the mythology of the whole thing. This idea of being a living dead and, and that you are in this limbo hell as represented in Norse mythology and, and your loved ones want to come down and save you and bring you back to the world. And maybe we should, in another episode, come back and repre represent the crowd that isn't ill. In a way, I, I, want, I would love to show people, you know, suffering from chronic illness, you know, that, you know, to me, it's, it's my, my girlfriend, it's my partner who is ill, but I'm still rooting for each and every one out there suffering from these things. And that makes us a giant crowd. If you look at all the relatives and all the people who love all the people who are currently sick, right? And maybe we should introduce a crowd, you know, someone standing behind them, you know, someone, something that could represent the whole world crying because that's one of the things, right? We all know that illnesses receive, you know, research and ultimately cures, you know, if, if you know, that, that old joke, you know, that, you know, if it was only, you know, the richer um, demographics, you know, of, you know, rich white men and their diseases, cardiovascular stuff and that sort of thing, you know. If you are in Denmark, it's it's a brilliant place to suffer from something that is sort of a something that you attain through unhealthy lifestyle, right? It's incredibly easy. But if you get something that is due to an an, an infection gone wrong, as most ME patients are simply, you know, the wrong gene that's turned on on the on the wrong time, and you know, and especially if you're a woman, right? Then you won't see as much research go into that sort of thing. And, um, and then you are in this limbo, this hell, and you depend on people enacting Hermul and jumping on Odin's horse and riding down to get you and bring you back from the dead completely, you know. And there was something there. And then the reference to Balder and him being being imprisoned, imprisoned in, in hell and because Loki didn't cry for him, even as every other creature did, he's not allowed to return to the world of the living until after Ragnarok. But then, here's the thing. Baldur comes out and returns to the world of the living after everything has been wiped out. And the world as we know it is about to begin. And so I think we all descend from Baldur in a way, you know. He comes out on the other end of things. He just had to endure. I don't know how many years, eons maybe, in hell. And, and I believe by taking these stories and, and seeing ourselves in a, in a big universal picture, albeit based on fantasy, it's still rooted in reality much more than any social realist drama will ever uh, be able to, uh, to come. And there, there is something there. So I think we're going to leave it today at, at these themes and what we came to was this, this half note ver variation of the theme. <laughs> And it could be anywhere, it could also be. And you will still get the feeling of. Which is the main theme. So we could go anywhere. And then we want to come down to this sort of hymn, this pastoral sort of death chant, Mozartian sort of thing, even though it's been used by many other composers and 
in songs from those days. sort of a main thing. We know we want to come down into hell and do some of these half note things and reference to the plunging of the pendulum. And, um, and we know we're probably going to introduce Ragnarok at some point. And so <laughs> this one just turns more and more completely out of control in some sort of epic direction. But that's fine. People living with these extreme circumstances, they deserve as much epic as they can get, because what they're doing is truly epic. So let's try and put it in here. So we need sort of a, and I think it should just be, you know, we know that it's northward and downward, they say. And so up here behind the crown of the tree, somewhere up here underneath the ox, maybe, you know, we could introduce hell. And here are the living dead. Or maybe it's all around and under the oceans and, here they lie, and and uh, just looking out and trying to remember their children and remember all the things worth fighting for, in spite and in the face of massive resistance. So, so these are that is you know I remember that from being a child and and you know these stories being read to me and and there are a lot of spin-offs in in Danish literature, you know, um, like Erik Minskesson, which is Erik, son of man, which is like a spin-off thing, and, and all sorts of books where they travel into the underworld. And you have that feeling of melancholy that those creatures trapped there in those stories. And they were once humans, you know, and people suffering from these illnesses trapped in these hell limbos, they are definitely human, and we need to get them out and get them back to the world of the living, and ideally before Ragnarok happens. And if not, then we will just have to, you know, you know, maybe, you know, this is all flooded, and on the other end of things, you know, they emerge. We don't know. We don't know. So... That's it for today. A little bit of death and doom and Ragnarok and even more myth sneaking into this composition. And that's all exciting.
tomorrow again on day eight of the composition of this The Gratitude Cult. Thank you for now.